السلام عليكم جميعا ورحمة الله وبركاته أعوذ بالله السميع العليم من الشيطان اللعين الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين وسلام على المرسلين وصلى الله على سيدنا وحبيبنا محمد وآله الطيبين الطاهرين رب اشرح لي صدري ويسر لي امري واحلل عقده من لساني يفقهوا قولي so we were talking about religious pluralism and the reflection of the quranic verses nowadays at our time there is a challenge there is a question that you muslims particularly you Shia, claim that the only group who is located in a right path and will go definitely to prosperity is Shia, the Twelvers. Shia is not Ashari. And the rest of the religions and the rest of the believers are on, on the wrong path, on the false path. It's too much. Tonight, I will provide you a type of internal challenge came from some Muslim scholars. And particularly, sometimes comes from Orientalists. They say even uh, religious pluralism is accepted based on the Islamic laws. Why? Because among the legal fiqhi system that you have in Islam, you have a ruling with regard to non-Muslims. If, for example, in a country like Islamic Republic of Iran, you have Islamic State. If nowadays you live in a non-Muslim country, so the government, the state is not yours is not running by Islamic State. Suppose a country like Iran, which is Islamic State. So the non-Muslim citizens, what is the situation of non-Muslim citizens? Christians, Jews, Zoroastrians, Hindus, Buddhists, in an Islamic State, you have a ruling that non-Muslims could live in an Islamic society while following their own religions. The only thing that you need to be careful is that they have to pay special tax. That we call it jizya. Jizya is a type of special tax for non-Muslims who are the citizens in an Islamic state. So when you believe and accept the ruling of Jizya, it means what? It means that there is religious pluralism. The state is Muslim, Islamic. The majority of the citizens are Muslims. But you allow them, you permit them to follow their own religion. They have churches, they have temples, they have their own, you know, religious institutions. Isn't it the case? This is a fiqhi, definite hook in Islam, jizya. So the ruling of jizya indicates that even in Islam, religious pluralism is accepted. This is a new argument with regard to religious pluralism. Our reflection, yes, we do have a ruling such as jizya and special tax paying, which is, uh, you know, obliged on non-Muslims. We do have this. But in an Islamic state, you divide the citizen into two groups, main citizen and sub-citizenship. Main citizen and sub-citizenship. 
main citizenship means the majority of the population. Even in a liberal democratic countries, what is the accepted ruling for a state is democracy. What is democracy? Democracy means the minorities always should follow the majority. Exactly we have the same in Islam. When the state is Islamic, it means that in the Islamic state, you have two types of group, uh, citizens. Main citizenships and sub-citizenship. Sub-citizenship, they have some limitations. For example, in United States, if you go and be landed immigrant, there is a difference between American citizens and landed immigrant. Landed immigrant, they do have green card. But by green card, do they have the right of voting? Of course not. Why? Because they consider, it, they consider them as sub-citizens. They are citizens, but sub-citizens. Sub-citizenship means limitations, means requirements, means condition. So, they are in the Islamic State, but they are not main citizens, they are sub-citizens. Some argue that according to the Islamic law, the Jews, Christians, and Zoroastrians, which are called Ahlul Dhimma. Which one? Ahlul Dhimma. What is Ahlul Dhimma? The people of oath or promise. We call them Ahlul Dhimma are allowed to enjoy their own faces within a Muslim society. Don't you have such a ruling? They argue that the ruling with regard to Ahlul Dhimma dictates religious pluralism. The Islamic State is even responsible in protecting the non-Muslim against all types of threat. If as non-Muslim they live in an Islamic state, the Islamic state is responsible to protect them. This Islamic law implies that other religion are also true. And that their followers can practice their own religion in an Islamic state. So what is religious pluralism? Religious pluralism means the right to follow your own faith and the principle of jizya and sub-citizenship indicates that yes, in Islam you have religious pluralism. Our reflection, you need to be, pay attention and be very careful because this is a recent argument with regard to religious pluralism. What, number one, there is a big difference between considering one religion as true and protecting their followers in a particular conditions. Sub-citizenship does not mean that Islam observe that their religion is true. And they have the same truthness as Islam. Sub-citizenship means you will have the right to live and to follow your own faith under particular conditions. In a Muslim society, followers of other religions should be allowed to live safely as sub-citizens and as minorities. Here in this country, in Tanzania, if Muslims are majority, the laws, the government, the system goes based on their benefit. If they are not majority, they are considered as minority. And minorities have always have their own limitations. So, this Islamic law has an important philosophy behind. 
You know, this is a very careful law and principle in Islam. Why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala afforded to Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam the ruling of jizya? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala could say, قَاتِلُوهُمْ حَتَّى لَا تَكُونَ fitna." Kill them, eradicate them. It doesn't say this. If it says that if they don't fight, if they are not opponents, if they are not troublemakers, leave them. Leave them to follow their own faith. What is the philosophy? There is a philosophy behind sub-citizenship. The reason is that one could say that the majority of these people had no access to Islam. Those non-Muslims who insist that we want to follow our own faith, one reason is that they, don't have, they didn't have any access to Islam. They don't have any information about Islam. When you give them sub-citizenship, they will have chance to observe Islamic faith, Islamic rulings, Islamic laws, so this is indeed a, a chance, this is indeed a type of opportunity to be familiar, to get familiar with Islamic teachings. This is first. So sub-citizenship is not the reason that we follow religious pluralism. Sub-citizenship has a philosophy. Number one, a chance to discover the truth for those people who live under the Islamic state. This is one. Second, Islam provided them a chance to discover the truth by allowing them to live peacefully in a Muslim society. So they have chance to come to the mosque, you know, to the gathering of Muslims, to meet, to have dialogue, to have gathering, uh, interfaith dialogue and things like this. This is a chance for anyone who didn't have any access to Islam to get familiar. Interestingly, among the great scholars in Islam, we have had those with un-Islamic background. If you refer to the history, you'll see some of the Quran interpreters, some of the theologians, some of the fuqaha, they were under non-Islamic faith. Only by getting a chance to live in a Muslim society, they became Muslim. This is the philosophy. They have only had the chance of becoming Muslim because of the chance they had in being sub-citizen in an Islamic society. Of course, of course, this is very important. This law is effective and will continue to be effective until the reappearance of Imam Mahdi. You know, last time someone came to me and asked me that there is a slogan coming from UK or, you know, internet, that yes, when Imam Mahdi, Jalallahu Ta'ala, Farajo Sharif will come, he will give chance to every non-Muslim to follow their own faith, and live in a Muslim society, in a global Mahdawi society peacefully. Who says this? This is exactly and explicitly anti-Islamic. When Imam Mahdi comes, لِيُرْذِهِرَ دِينَهُ عَلَى الدِّينَ وَلَوْ كَرِهًا وَلَوْ كَرِهًا كَافِرُونَ Explicit statement in the Quran that at the time of Imam Mahdi global state there won't be any opportunity chance you know and freedom to follow your own religion so what is the obstacle what is the problem problem is whether political or cognitive or into intellectual there is nothing to be worried about everything is clear so why are you insisting so, sub-citizenship has no room at the time of Imam Mahdi Ajallallahu Ta'ala Faraj Sharif. But in the Islamic Republic of Iran, we do have different non-Muslim who live peacefully under the Islamic State. 
This is for those whose contemporary respect is a chance to look for the truth, although their religion is not a true one. So subsistenceship does not uh, have nothing to do with truthness. Only a chance for non-Muslim to become familiar with Islamic ruling. But there is no force, there is no imposement until the time of Imam Mahdi. When Imam Mahdi reappears, the story will be different. But those non-Muslims, even nowadays, e even contemporarily, those non-Muslim who get chance to live as sub-citizen, there are some conditions. They have to follow those conditions. Number one, they must not do sin in public places. They, they, they don't have the right that say, yes, we drink alcohol and we need special places to sell and to buy alcohol drinks. In an Islamic state, you don't have such a right to do sin publicly. Yes, hiddenly, secretly, no problem. This is first. Second, they are not allowed to advertise their slogans. You know, they don't have right to send their missionaries and muballighin and propagator here and there to <laughs> propagate about their faith. They don't have such a right. This is second. Third one. They have to pay special tax as the substitute for what Muslim pays as, as khums and zakat. Muslims pay khums and zakat. What about the non-Muslim? They have to pay a substitute like what we call it jizya. Therefore, living in a Muslim society for non-Muslim is indeed a contract with special conditions. This is a contract. This is not the reason that their faith and religion is true. And we follow religious pluralism. It's not. Quran chapter 9 verse number 7. In the case in this way. A'udhu billahi minash shaytanir rajeem. A higher volume, a bit more energetically and actively. You are responding in a passive way and you, you are sending me a signal of exhaustion. Please. This is Quran and you want to make your mouth perfume with, uh, with perfume of Quran. A'udhu billahi minash shaytanir rajeem. كيف يكون للمشركين عهد عند الله وعند رسوله إلا الذين عاهدتم عند المسجد الحرام Look at the red. فَمَسْتَقَامُوا لَكُمْ فَاسْتَقِيمُوا لَهُمْ إِنَّ اللَّهَ يُحِبُّ الْمُتَّقِينَ So long as they act straight forwardly, with you. فَمَسْتَغَامُوا لَكُمْ فَاسْتَغِيمُوا لَهُمْ So long as they act straightforwardly with you, be straightforward with them. So contracts are built always based on some political, cultural, and economical mutual interest. They are the citizens and they have to pay whatever all other citizens they pay. Psychological aspect of religious pluralism. Some <laughs> scholars recently, they say we don't have anything to do with jizya or tax payment or things like that. 
psychologically it, it is too much to believe that a small group uh, among the all humanity are true, are pious, going toward prosperity, and the rest of humanity and population are going wrong way. It's too much. It's not reasonable. Psychologically, it's hard for anyone to believe this one. This is, we call it psychological aspect of religious pluralism. It's too difficult to believe that only a small group among the whole population will go to the paradise and the rest to go to hellfire. Is it reasonable? This is the core of the argument. Is it reasonable that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala creates all human beings and then send them all to hell? If you go by singularism, not pluralism, it means that the majority of humanity go to hellfire and only a very few small group go to heaven? It's too much. How is it that Philosophers, innovators, great scholars, and those who served humanity go to hell, and only a slum, small group of weak people who claim that they are Shia, they go to heaven? What about Einstein? What about Pastor? What about people who are the innovators? It's too much. They argue in this way. Our reflection. When we say Shia are located on a right path, it is not a blank check. You know, you give a blank check and give, okay, write down the amount as you like. What do you mean by Shia? What do you mean by Shia 12? Is he or she practicing? Going forward? following the Islamic moral codes, submitted, dedicated, or on, only Muslim by name, on, only hypocrites. So that small group has qualification that they need to gain it. Three major groups among the believers. In any faith, in any religion, you will find three groups. There are three main groups, even among Shia, among, Mus among Muslims, among Christians. Number one, in terms of following religion, people can be divided into three major groups. Group number one, those who arrive to the truth and true religion, at any time and follow it practically. So those who find the truth and follow it practically, they will definitely go to heaven and will get prosperity. Practicing Muslims, the pious people, like Fuqaha nowadays, they are the most beneficial people on the earth. Look at humanity as the creature of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Even Imam Ali alayhi salam, in his sermon in, in, in his Nahjul Balagha, he says, it's not just a matter of faith. إِمَّا أَخُلْ لَكَ فِي الدِّينِ أَوْ نَدِيرٌ لَكَ فِي الْخَالِقِ The humanity are not all sinful. Whether they are the brothers and sisters of your faith, or they are human beings. If they are, you know, human beings and they have their own life. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does not motivate you to fight with anyone. So group number one, dedicated, submitted believers. Number two, those who know the truth but willingly deny it and do not follow it. There are many Muslims, 
They claim that they are Muslims, but they do not follow it. They are not practicing. When you, for example, live with them, when you go traveling, you see that there is no difference between this and a Christian, and a Jew, and an atheist. Only the name. Previously, they had some signs. For example, if he has beer, it means that he's Muslim. Nowadays, if someone has beer, does it show that he's Muslim? So, this is possibly because they cannot forget their wishes and their desires. Faithful, believer, but they are following their wishes. When you ask, he said, I don't like it. This is my life. I don't want to be intervened. Don't intervene, please. Leave me alone. And when you ask about donations and, you know, help, they said, no, sorry, this is not my problem. The culture of indifference. The culture of following wishes and desires. Are they really considered Muslims? Careless? Indifferent? An example in the Quran, chapter 75, verses 3 to 5. Does man reckon we shall never gather his bones together again? Of course we are capable of reshaping even his fingertips. Yet man wants to, to carry us right out in the open. So what is the philosophy of some Muslims or believers that they are not practicing? They want to be free. Mukallaf is under the pressure of taklif. When you are free, so what is the difference between you and a non-Muslim? Why they don't follow? Because they want to be free. They are looking for an open gate to do whatever they wish. And they call themselves as Muslim. We don't consider this group as Muslim, as believers. There's no difference between this group and atheists. This group is well aware of the reality, but deny it so that they do not have to stick with difficulty, with difficult practices. They do not want to be mukallaf. They want to get rid of taklif. Also, the Quran says in chapter 27, verse 14, they denied them wrongfully and arrogantly, even though they themselves felt certain about it. Why they denied, why they rejected. فَانْدُرْ كَيْفَ كَانَ عَقِبَةُ الْمُفْسَدِينَ Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, this group are, are the tyrants. This group are those who are seeking for tyranny and corruption. Imam Ali, alayhi salam, says in Dua Kumail, this group will certainly go to hell. Although they claim that they are the أَقْسَمْتَ أَنْ تَمْلَأَهَا مِنَ الْكَافِرِينَ مِنَ الْجِنَّةِ وَالنَّاسِ أَجْمَعِينَ And then, وَأَنْ تُخَلِّدَ فِيهَا الْمَعَانِدِينَ Who are ma'anidin? Are those believers who deny consciously? Group number three. Those who have not have any access to the true religion. Of course, nowadays, I believe that it's very difficult to believe that you could find a group 
that they have no access to Islam or to truth or to reality. We are living at the age of cyber. Everything is clear. Everything. So is it really imaginable that today we think some people have no access to the truth? Impossible. But who don't have? In the jungle? Even the, if they have mobile, they go by to the internet and they come up with all types of information and, you know, groups and they do business, they do uh, treatment, global, even global information. Okay, if you could find a group which have no access to any type of information, only, you know, trees, river, eating, and sleeping, if you could find. And follow what they find as true. Like Messiah. If you could find a group of Messiah that they don't have any access to any type of information. They are excused before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. They are excused. Why? Because they are following to the extent of their understanding. For example, the people who live in the Nik Nikronizi, Nikronizi Island. Someone told me that Mr. Shamili, in Nikronizi Island, there are people who have no access to anything. If you could find such, this group in Islam is known as Mustad'af. And Mustad'af does not go to heaven, to, to hell. Why? Because intellectually they are oppressed. Most of the Afin, they are not going to hell. This group is responsible only to the extent of their knowledge and their understanding. In this case, we have the responsibility to provide them with the message of Islam. This is our responsibility, not their responsibility. Therefore, no one can assert that all non-Muslim will be in the hell. So this statement is the wrong one. We don't claim, we don't assert that all oh, non-Muslims we go to hell. Who says that? When someone asks you, you immediately tell, it depends. It depends on the different condition of understanding, accessibility, availability, condition, and things like that. However, we have to keep in mind that even the first group that goes to paradise must have some qualification. Imam Bagher said, when you claim that you are our follower, you have to be careful in your action. When people look at you, they are willing to come to Islam. Kunu lana zayna wa la takunu alayna. Behave in a way that people, when people look at your behavior, you look at your lifestyle, they are willing to become Muslim. Not they hate and distance from you. They escape. Only for dedicated Muslim, there are some qualifications. For example, we are in need of a true lasting faith that will lead to piety and fear of God. Keeping us away from all types of sins. Those who commit sin, those who commit sins continuously, will finally lose their faith. And this is the, the meaning of the true Muslim are those who come to a final phase. Who are true Muslim? Those who come to a final phase. Who preserves the final phase? Those who avoid from sinning, conducting sins. So committing continuous sins will finally lead to the loss the, the, the loose of the, your faith. They will die as unbelievers. Quran reveals in chapter 30, verse number 10. 
then the end of those who died evil was the worst consequence because they denied the signs of Allah and used the ridic and, and used to ridicule them. ثم كان عاقبة الذين أساءوا السوء أن كذبوا بآيات الله وكانوا بها يستهزئون. They are Muslim, but they continuously do sin to come up with this type. Summing up, elements that have made an important impact on religious pluralism. Number one was psychological hardship in believing that only a, a small group gains prosperity and the rest go to the hell. Do, number two, being exhausted from bloody controversies among followers of different religions in human history. And number three, a great willingness toward Islam among different people in all countries of the world and a feeling of threat from Christianity. These were three main impact for pluralism that I explained and I reflected on that. Some people claim that belief, just I'm finishing, several few slides I'm finished. There is a last argument and I finish. Some people uh, claim that belief is enough. When someone is mu'min, when someone enjoys faith, that's enough. Whether you do fasting, you do uh, praying, you go to Hajj or not, this is not important. Important thing is your heart, is your belief. Using some allegorical verses in the Quran that they say only belief in Allah and in hereafter is enough for prosperity and being saved from punishment. Response. If someone claims that belief is enough, we don't need to go to practices. This faith will save us only if we believe comprehensively. And we follow Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam in all teaching. When we do claim that we have belief in Islam, what does it mean? It means that in heart only, what about praying? What about fasting? What about Hajj? Isn't it Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam who said, Sallu kama raitumuni usalli. And even with regard to night praying, wa min al layli fatahajjad bihi nafilatan like. He was a very practicing and as a follower we just distance from practices. This is not accepted. Two, non Muslim in Muslim societies are respected and are free to practice their own faith. Does uh, sub-citizenship indicate that Islam accept religious pluralism? No. I told you, this is a chance to become familiar with Islam and under some condition. This respects only a contemporary contract. They are still sub-citizen. This, this respect is different than being than being in a true religion. And number three, it is hard for understanding that only the Shia as a small group in this group, in this world are going on, are going on the right path while the others go astray. And the response. Having a label is not enough. So we need to keep in mind against religious pluralism. Yes, if you are Shia Muslim, you go to hell. You go to heaven. Of course you go. Under some conditions. That condition if a Sunni, a Shi'i, whoever who follows this qualification, they go to heaven. Number one, having a label is not enough. Being a Muslim by name is not enough. Number two, religiosity must, must appear in or daily behavior and make us different. If we follow religion, but practically and in terms of behavior, there is no difference between us. Do we go to heaven? 
So faith must create change in our lifestyle and in our behavior. And three, therefore we have to know Islam and Shaism properly and practice it comprehensively. Moreover, only those who deny Islam consciously and willingly will go to hell. However, those who do not have any access to Islam and uh, to Islam are exempt from any punishment. Everyone is only responsible to the extent of their knowledge and denial of what knows not to be true. So if you are following your knowledge, your understanding, you are excused. Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala don't ask unless up to your knowledge. La yukallifullahu nafsan illa wus'aha. Intellectual oppression and istidhaf is an excuse before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala where we would have the responsibility of being silent and not showing the true way of Islam to the people. Allahumma nawwir qulubana bil Qur'an waj'alhu lana dalilan wa hadiyan ya waliyan ihsan.